Greetings, Rob Chastner here. <clears throat> Continuing our study verse by verse through the uh, prophet Isaiah. And so if you're uh, following along in your Bibles, um, open up to chapter 47 in the book of Isaiah. Um, in chapter The 47th chapter is a prophecy of Isaiah that he's bringing against <clears throat> Babylon, <clears throat> where he is once again predicting the destruction of the city of Babylon, and this has got to be a difficult, uh, uh, has got to be difficult for each of us to comprehend and to imagine how impossible or how unimaginable that this might have sounded to his audience, the audience of Isaiah, uh, that such an impregnable a fortress uh, could ever be destroyed or taken down. Uh, our last study, we discussed in detail how thick the three walls were around this city and the two moats in between the three walls. And understand that when the Medes and the Persians had the city surrounded, the Babylons were having a drunk fest led by the king Belshazzar, grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and they were desecrating the artifacts that were taken from the destruction of Solomon's temple in 587 BC. Belshazzar thought, let all nations gather against us, this city will not fall. And this prophecy must have sounded ridiculous to Isaiah, makes me wonder if he was questioning if this was the message that he actually heard from God, or perhaps was it his mind playing games with him. Uh, there really is nothing so bizarre which we could ever compare it with in today's world. Uh, there was no human being during this period of history who thought Babylon could be penetrated or taken down, but God knew that this was going to happen because God made it happen, and we know that God is sovereign. Uh, history proves to us that lives can change overnight, nations can change overnight, and are we not witnessing our nation being radically changed and potentially our lives being radically changed as a result? Did you think just for a short few years that a, a short few years ago that we were living in a nation uh, where the deficit was approaching two trillion dollars a year you know we have transgender bathrooms in public schools now uh, you know we have gay marriages ruled by the courts we have Sharia law in some of the states in America and we aren't able to use a Bible in the public but we must make the Quran available to swear in a new judge and so forth and so on. These things which might have seemed impossible or unimaginable have happened right before our eyes in our own lifetimes. That is what we are will see now in Isaiah chapter 47 with the fall of Babylon. Let's begin with verses 1, 2, and 3. Go, go down, sit in the dust, virgin daughter Babylon, sit on the ground without the throne, Queen city of the Babylonians, no more will you be called tender or delicate. Take millstones and grind flour. Take off your veil, lift up your skirts, bare your legs, and wade through the streams. Your nakedness will be exposed and your shame uncovered. I will take vengeance. I will spare no one. You understand that God does not bargain with man nor with humanity. One of the benefits of being God is that you do not need to bargain with anybody. Uh, you just do what it is you want to do. He says, I arbitrate with no man. All right, verses 4 through 9 say, Our Redeemer, the Lord Almighty in his name, is the Holy One of Israel. Sit in silence, go into darkness, queen city of the Babylonians, no more will you be called queen of kingdoms. I was angry with my people and desecrated my inheritance. 
I gave them into your hand, and you showed them no mercy, even on the age, the aged, um, you laid a very heavy yoke. You said, I am forever the eternal queen, but you did not consider these things or reflect on what might happen. Now then, listen, you lover of pleasure, lounging in your security and saying to yourself, I am, and there is none besides me. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Both of these will overtake you in a moment on a single day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come unto you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells. Now, Babylon was completely full of themselves and rightfully so from a human perspective. They controlled everything and nobody could take them down. Um, you know, again, from a human perspective, unless you had some type of nuclear device, and we know those devices are not going to be coming along for, uh, for, for, for centuries. And so they were full of themselves thinking that no one could take them down. Now, the imagery that God uses here, uh, they, are, they were like a queen and princes. They did not have soiled hands. They did not do manual labor. Um, <clears throat> they were wealthy. People catered to them. They had tons of slaves, and those slaves took care of them. And the imagery with God uses here, uh, which God uses here, is that you are going to be stripped of all of that. You, meaning Babylon, are going to be stripped and find yourselves in garments of slaves. You are going to be running for your lives, running through the rivers, and you are going to be doing manual labor. And notice the reason why. God says, I was angry with my people, that's Israel, and I decided to use Babylon as a rod and a staff or as a corrective measure. Babylon was initially an instrument of God's in God's hands. You remember from the book, uh, uh, the pronunciation commonly known, Habakkuk, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, have, uh, Habakkuk is how it might sound in Hebrew. He said, God, you are not going, uh, you, you are not talking, you are not doing anything. I am tired of seeing all the bad things in the world. And so if you are not going to do anything about, uh, don't, don't show me because uh, I do not want to see it. And God said, I am working, but I am not going to tell you what I'm working, what I'm going to do, because if I tell you what I'm going to do, you are never going to believe it. So Habakkuk said, I will believe it. God said, no, you won't believe it. And he said, try me. And so God said, you know, the Babylonians, uh, they're wicked, terrible people. I'm going to use them to judge you in Israel. And of course, God is always right. And Habakkuk says, um, I don't believe it. I, uh, he didn't believe because uh, that seemed so bizarre uh, to human beings. You can look at the first two chapters in the uh, book of Habakkuk. Um, and so um, uh, God is using the Babylonians to adjust in Israel's behavior. But notice God is saying to the Babylonians, you did not use any mercy. You overstepped your boundaries. God says, I'm going to bring correction. Uh, I used you to bring correction, but you did not bring correction. You brought destruction. You showed no mercy. You showed no compassion. You showed no tender tenderness. So now, if that is the way you treat people, then that is the way I am going to to treat you. And so if you ever find yourself in a situation where God is using you to bring correction to another person, God gives you some insight. Uh, uh, they are not living the way that they're supposed to be living. And you have it in your heart that you're going to go over there and confront them with these issues. 
uh, these scriptures are saying that you need to be careful, you need to be cautious, because the purpose of the confrontation is to bring restoration, not to bring destruction. What did the Apostle Paul tell the Galatians? He said, if a brother is overtaken in a fall, you as a brother are to restore, not to destroy, but to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Now remember, Jesus uh, described himself as being meek, and that doesn't mean to be a weak or a, a weasel or anything like that. What it means, it's the same meaning as uh, when you train a horse. When you train a horse, the horse is still under the guidance and the power of the owner of the horse, but he still has his strength and he still has his spirit. So the spirit of meekness means that you're you're still strong, you're still spirited, but you're you're putting yourself under the authority of God. And so here the Babylon Babylon was used by God as a corrective measure for the behavior of Israel. Babylon overstepped their boundaries, and so God is going to lower the boom on the entire nation of Babylon. All right, let's look at verses 10 and 11. You have trusted in the wickedness and you said and have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge mislead uh, you when you say to yourself, I am and there is none besides me. Disaster will come upon you and uh, you will not know how to conjure it away. A calamity will fall upon you that you cannot ward off with a ransom. A catastrophe you cannot foresee will suddenly come upon you. All right, and so we see oftentimes success ruins people. It brings a person to a place where they think they're greater or smarter than they really are. They think that they're going, they're better than other people. We have all seen people like this, and hopefully none of us are among those people. These people are filled with haughtiness. They're filled with themselves, and that sometimes you can't even stand to be in the same room with such a person. That is what we are seeing here in these scriptures about the Babylonians. Notice God says, you have been wrapped, warped, sorry, you've been warped, and because you have become warped, you do not see the judgment that is coming. All right, verses 12 through 15 say, keep on then with your magic spells and with your many sorceries, which you have labored at since childhood. Perhaps you will succeed, perhaps you will cause terror. All the counsel that you have received um, uh, has only worn you out. Let your astrologers come forward, those stargazers who make predictions month by month, let them save you from what is coming upon you. Surely they are like stubble. Their fire will burn them up. They cannot even save themselves from the power of the flame. These are not, these are not coals of warmth, but they are. this is not a fire to sit by. This is all they are to you. The, these you have dealt with and labored with since childhood, all of them go on in their error. error. Uh, there is not one that can save you. Now, of course, Babylon, being the birthplace of so many occultic practices, uh, um, uh, and so God is saying, ask uh, these guys if they can take care of you. And God is saying that not only will they these sorcerers not be able to take care of you, the people of Babylon, but they will not be able to take care of themselves. God's last word on this in verse 15 is, no one will save you. Imagine what a terrifying experience it would be for a soul to leave this world at war with God, to leave this world with the thought that all throughout eternity there is no one who will save me. Now look, uh, uh, Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, then who can be against us? This is a two-edged sword. If God is against us, then it doesn't matter who 
is for you because if that person is an enemy of God, no one can stop God. But never, uh, but never forget that if God is for us, then no one can get us. All right, chapter 48, um, uh, we have uh, Jacob being used here. We have Israel being used here. And it's used interchangeably. Uh, but you have to understand that Jacob has a meaning. Uh, uh, Jacob is, in fact, an, a transliteration of what that name sounds like in Hebrew. It's spelled in English. What does it mean, though? What's the translation? It means deceiver. It means heel catcher or one who is crafty. Then you've got the word Israel. Israel is, is a Hebrew word. And when you see it in English, that's what it sounds like in Hebrew, Israel. But what is the translation? Translation means governed by God. So if you're a person who is governed by God, you live your life governed by God, then you are part of Israel. So when you hear the term, the name Jacob, think of deceiver, heel catcher, or one who is crafty. When you hear Israel, you think those people who are governed by God. So notice, as we read the first verses, God is saying to the people of Israel, uh, saying that, that the people of Israel were crafty, but they wanted to be called Israel, or they want to be called governed by God. Let's look at verses 1 through 5. Listen to this, you descendants of Jacob, you who are called by the name of Israel and come in the line of Judah, you who have taken oaths in the name of the Lord, and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth and or righteousness. You who call yourselves uh, citizens of the holy city and claim to rely on the God of Israel, the Almighty is his name. I foretold the former things long ago. My mouth announced them and I made them known that suddenly I acted and then and they came to pass, for I knew how stubborn you were. Your neck muscles were iron. Your forehead was bronze. Therefore, I told you these things long ago. Before they happened, I announced them to you so that you could not say my images brought them about. My wooden image and my metal God, small g, God, um, ordained them. All right, understand the stubbornness of Israel. They were attending synagogue. They were praying all of the right things. They were saying all the right things. Uh, the problem is that uh, there was not truth. There was no righteousness there. This is a lesson for today. You cannot go to church and to Bible studies, do what is right in front of your brothers and sisters in the public, and then go into a world uh, and cheat and steal from your neighbor in your business transactions. There is no righteousness in that kind of a lifestyle. You read the book of Judges. Israel was acts stubborn. Uh, then the enemies come marching in. Then God delivers Israel from the enemies. Then Israel forgets God. And then it repeats this cycle over and over again. Um, we see uh, Israel's stubbornness again in John chapter 8, verses 32 to 35, where Jesus says, I am here to set you free. And they said, well, how can you set us free, being that we have never been in bondage of any man? This is out of the mouth of a Pharisee who is under the rule of the Roman Empire, standing over his shoulders. Now, how about the story of Passover and Moses and the plagues? Uh, Israel was so stinking stubborn that they were blinded by their own pride and their own self-righteousness. They had somehow created this reality in their own minds that they had never been in bondage by, uh, to another man. Now, God says, look, I have spoken prophecy. I told you what was going to happen. I wasn't going to wait thousands of years to fulfill the prophecy because I know you people and I know that if I waited, you would forget what I prophesied. Then you would turn around to your idol worshiping. Therefore, God is saying, I spoke the prophecy, I fulfilled the prophecy, 
What more do you need to stop your stu stubborn behavior? Verses 6 through 9 say, You have heard these things. Look at them all. Will you not admit them? From now on, I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. They are created now and not long ago. And um, you have not heard of them before today. You cannot say, yes, I knew of them. Uh, you have neither heard nor understood from of old. Your ears have not been open. When, when do I know how treacherous you are? You were called a rebel from birth. For my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you so as not to destroy you completely. So we should be thankful for verse number nine. This is one of those verses in the Bible which we should be giving thanks to God day after day. If God would have cut them off right then and right there, what would have been the result? There would be no Jesus Christ, no Savior, no Messiah, because the Messiah was to come through the nation of Israel. God was justified in his own anger to destroy them right there. That would have resulted in no hope for Israel and then, of course, no hope for all of mankind. All right, verses 10 through uh, 13, we're in chapter 48. See, I have refined you uh, through not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake, I do this. Um, you'll notice there's a repetition there. There's no superlatives in Hebrew. So when God repeats something, he is accentuating it. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. Listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. My own hand laid the foundations on the, of the earth and my right hand spreads over the heavens. When I summon them, they, will all, they all stand up together. Uh, this is a difficult concept for humans to accept. But in verse number eight, God is telling exactly where the problem lays. He says that we have been transgressors from the womb. Uh, humans like to connect our transgressions with our environment. We want to make our sins environmental, you know, such as I was raised in an abusive environment or I did not have a good consistent role model. You know, I've grown up angry or insecure. And so what so when we have transgressions, we don't automatically think I'm a sinner. We think the environment raised me to, to, to behave this way as a sinner. So all of your history is true, but there has come uh, a point in your life where you make decisions for yourself. Nobody forces you to make a decision. You choose self-destructive behavior. You choose behavior that would cause harm to yourself or to somebody else. And at that point, you have your own decisions uh, to, to make. In verse 8, it says that we have come out of moms of, of our moms broken. Um, uh, we have been broken since the moment we were conceived. The only way for a person to get better is acknowledgement uh, that that uh, that they have been uh, that they have a sin nature, and the only way one that can help us is the Lord. Do not blame things on an inex, uh, insensitive spouse. Don't blame things on the lack of income or an abusive parent. The only way to fix things is to humble yourself before God. The common denominator in all of your problems is you. And the ver these verses say, you were a rebel from birth. The power of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit, along with the humbling of yourself, is where you'll find a remedy. All right, verses 14 through 17 say, Come together, all of you, and listen. Which of the idols was foretold these things? The Lord's chosen ally will carry out his purpose against Babylon. His arm will be against the Babylonians. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I will bring him, and he will succeed in his mission. Come near me and listen to this. 
from the first announcement, I have spoken in secret. And uh, at the time it happens, I am there. And now the sovereign Lord has said, has sent me uh, endowed with his spirit. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. This is obviously referring uh, once again to Cyrus, the king of the Medes and the Persians, who conquered the Babylonians. Earlier, God referred to him as a ser servant of the Lord, uh, the one who is going to do God's will. Here in these verses, God is saying that Cyrus is going to prosper and he is going to succeed. God does not say you have to be broke and living homeless under a bridge to be a follower of the Lord. God is not against success. He's not against prosperity. If you follow God's commands, your life will lend itself to prosperity and to success. God's word will teach you how to prosper. We'll notice it now in verses 17 through 19, which says, This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, <clears throat> your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea, your descendants would have been like the sand, your children like its numbers, numberless grains, their name would never be blotted out nor destroyed from before me. Uh, one of the problems in studying the Bible is that you cannot hear the inflictions of the voices of those who are sending God's message. You might have, you know, what might it have sounded like? I wish you, you know, you would heed my commands you know, what maybe his teeth were clenched, maybe his face was red. It was likely that it would have sounded more like a brokenhearted father, almost a longing in his voice, or I wish you would have listened to me. I wish you would have never lived your lives that way. <sighs> you know, uh, like a parent who wants to bless his children to see them have a great life, it is like you see your kid on the street corner selling crack. You know, you can't bless your children when they are in the midst of rebellion. Because if you bless them during rebellion, you're, you're strengthening and you're fortifying them for more rebellion. This is like God sitting down with his, uh, his kids and saying, these are the rules of the house. Obey them and you will have a wonderful uh, life filled with blessings if you don't you're going to have comments, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, problems. Okay, uh, verses 20 to 22, leave Babylon, fl flee from the Babylonians, announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it, send it out to the ends of the earth, say the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Uh, they did not thirst when he led them out of the deserts. He, um, he made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. And so even though they have blown it, God continues to be merciful to them. And he sa he's saying, if you want peace, stop being stupid. Obey the ways of God. Obey the words of God. Obey the laws of God. And you will have a wonderful and blessed life. It doesn't take a great brain to understand. Be nice to one another, pray to God, and love God. God's way is simple and uncomplicated. Get outside of yourself, and you will see how easy it is to follow God's laws and ways and words. You see all of these mega stars in Hollywood. They have private jets, oceanfront homes, you know, and that's the life. Look at verse 22. There is no peace for the wicked. Why do these big money people with private jets find themselves in and out of rehab centers? Why do you see these owners of oceanfront homes strung out on drugs? It is because they have no peace. They are wicked. They're leading wicked lives. They're living their lives contrary to the word of God, and they are completely self-centered. 
what value can one place on the fact that we can lay our heads on the pillow and know that we will wake up tomorrow in perfect peace? Um, Isaiah 26.3 says, Shalom, Shalom in the Hebrew, meaning perfect peace. Knowing that God is with me, God is going to take care of me. These mega stars don't have enough money to buy that which we already have once we have made a profession of faith in the true and one Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. We're now in chapter 49. Let's look at the first six verses. <clears throat> Listen to me, you idols. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. He has spoken my name. He made my mouth like the sh sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hands, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, uh, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I, spent my, I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hands. <clears throat> and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, and bring back those in, of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Now, obviously, he is talking about Jesus Christ here. Notice that Christ was hidden in the quiver of the Father. When you go through the Old Testament, it takes some spiritual wisdom to see Jesus Christ, who is concealed. But we also know, uh, we also now have the New Testament, and we see revealed Jesus Christ is the servant of the Lord. And we say, hey, wait a minute. In verse 3, it says, you are my servant, Israel. Well, remember that is what Israel means. It means those who are governed by God. Uh, and the true Israel, in fact, the only one throughout history who has who, who was the true Israel is Jesus Christ. He's the only man ever to live without sin. What does that mean? No sin. He lived his life governed by God. Jesus said in John chapter 6, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. John 4 says, uh, Jesus explained my food, uh, meat, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The verses say uh, in verses five and six, you are my servant Israel and will bring back Israel. How could this be talking about a nation? This is talking about Jesus, a servant of God, the one who is truly governed by God. He, Jesus, is was to bring Israel back to God. And notice it says, I am also <coughs> going to give you the Gentiles. All right, verses 7 uh, through 9 say, This is what the Lord says, The Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred um, by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and stand up, princes will see you and bow down, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has, cho has chosen you? This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of my of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you uh, to be a covenant of the people, to restore the land and to reassign the desolate inheritances, to say to the captives, come out uh, and to those in darkness, feel f be free. They will feed uh, beside the roads and find pasture in every barren hill. Uh, we continue 
verses 10 through 13. Uh, they will neither hunger nor first thirst. They will, uh, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar, some from the north, some from the west, and uh, some from the region of Aswan. Uh, shout for joy, uh, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth, bursting into song, your mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. And then verse 14 through 18 says, But Zion said, The Lord hath has forsaken me the lord has forgotten me can a mother forget a baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has has born though she may forget i will not forget you see i have engraved you on the palms of my hands your walls are ever before me your children hasten back and those who laid your waist apart uh from you Lift up your eyes and look around, all you children, and gather and come to you, uh, and come to you, as surely as I live, declares the Lord. You will wear them all as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. All right. As God was dealing with Israel, these people were saying, "I don't think God likes me. I don't think I'm saved. I don't think God really knows what what's going on in my life." So the Lord is saying to Israel. You have gone through a season of difficulty. I haven't forgotten you. I can't forget you. And notice the reason God gives that he can't forget Israel. And that's in verse 16. He says, I have engraved you in the palms of my hands. No doubt this verse will come to our minds when we wake up in glory one day and we see the scorned hands of Jesus Christ. God doesn't love you because of the balance in your bank account. God doesn't love you because of your personal accomplishments. God doesn't love you because you're the most popular kid in your class. These things come and they go. Money, accomplishments, popularity. They come and they go. They're no measuring stick for the love of God. There is only one measuring stick for the love of God, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ the nail scarred hands. Imagine being in the military in a war zone, a hand grenade gets thrown in and you throw yourself down on top of the hand grenade, you get blown up, you save the other troops uh, lives from this heroic act and imagine uh, it was you that was saved, years pass and you find yourself in a financial hard time and uh, you know, would you take the attitude that this guy was not your friend because he left you out of his will? The dead guy would likely have come back from his grave and said, you're an idiot. I, you know, I threw myself on top of, of this grenade to save your life. What do you mean I'm not your friend? And so here is uh, Israel always complaining, always questioning the love of God in their lives. God hasn't done this or that in my life. Understand that God has saved you from the judgment to come. He loved you so much that he allowed his own body to be scarred for the marks which we laid on him. All right, let's take a look at verses 19 to, uh, through all the way through to 26. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people, and those who devoured you will be far away. The children born during your bereavement will, set, will yet say in your hearing, place, This place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. Then you will say in your heart, Who bore me these? I was bereaved and barren. I was exiled and rejected. Who brought these up? I was left alone, all alone, these, but these uh, where, um, where have they come from? This is what the Sovereign Lord says, see I will beckon to the nations, I will lift 
up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I have beckoned to the nations. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. I will, uh, kings will be your foster fathers and their queens, your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you with their faces on the ground. They will lick the dust off your feet. They will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Can plunder be taken from warriors or captives be rescued from the fierce? But this is what the Lord says. Yes, captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children I will save. I will make your oppressions eat their own flesh. They will be drunk on their own blood as with wine. Then all mankind will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. All right. So it is likely that God is not finished dealing with the nation of Israel yet. It is likely, it is likely that when you when you look at the true meaning of the fall festivals, along with the grace and mercy and long suffering that God has given to His people, that it, uh, uh, that Israel as a nation will be given another opportunity in end times between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur uh, for salvation. Yom Teruah, of course, also known as Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Um, so no doubt that um, what uh, Isaiah is prophesying here is going to take place during the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ as he rules and reigns over the nation of Israel and all of these oppressors, all the Arab states that were formerly sought for, were, that have formerly sought to destroy Israel, they are going to come. They're going to bow down. They're going to acknowledge that they themselves have been worshiping the wrong god. And again, a small g. And so, uh, what Isaiah is describing here is what when God is through with His plan of redemption. There is going to be complete restoration. Everything is going to be restored. And not only is it going to be restored, but it's all going to be even better than it was before. So as we go through life, things happen. Bad things happen. Good things happen. Things are lost. Things are damaged. But the promise is all things are going to be restored. And even then, uh, 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 they're going to be even better than they were before. And who is going to restore things for us? Our God is alive. Our God is working. When all is finished, everything that this world and sin and Satan have stripped you from will be restored. And in this kingdom of heaven on earth, there is where, that, that is where we will come to a full understanding of just how much God loves us. Isaiah prophesied here, God blesses those who are obedient to his word and who wait upon him. Amen. Okay, I hope this has been helpful and informative. The next study in Isaiah will be in uh, chapters 50, 51, and 52. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Thank you for viewing. Amen and good day.